Good afternoon, everybody. Hello, hello, hello. You guys are so much better than the faculty and staff in my school. Um, <laughs> takes at least three good mornings before anybody pays any attention. So welcome this afternoon. I'm Betsy Farmer. I'm the Dean of the School of Social Work here at the University of Pittsburgh. And we are very happy to welcome you to the Raymond Webb Lecture this afternoon. So for those of you in the room, for those of you joining us from home um, or from Mechanicsburg, um, we are very happy to have you with us. Um, and I'm very excited to have this lecture. Um, this is the, the Raymond R. Webb Jr. Um, endowed lecture. And as some of you in this room know, the Webb Lecture was endowed to really um, amplify and to continue to be talking about public welfare. Um, that in social work, this is obviously core to everything that we do. And so this lecture allows us each year to bring in someone who is working in the field, doing research in the field, doing something to expand and promote the field. Um, and it's, it's an honor for us to be able to do that because it's, as as I've said a million times, you don't do social work from the 21st floor of an ivory tower. Um, you need to be out among people who are actually doing this, actually experiencing the systems and the situations that make social work so incredibly relevant in our world. And so I'm very, very grateful for us to be here. So. I want to tell you a little bit about Raymond Webb because he is the namesake of this lecture today. Um, and he was a real pioneer and um, a, very, a real visionary um, in the um, public mental health um, and developmental disabilities area um, and uh, was the director of the first community mental health center in the Pittsburgh area. Um, he also uh, co-founded the Pennsylvania Community Providers Association and um, he's done a whole bunch of stuff. And so um, when he passed away in 2006, he inspired some of his friends and colleagues to endow this lecture in his memory and in his name um, with the hope of continuing the work that he was doing with future generations of social work scholars, practitioners, leaders, uh, policy makers. So we're incredibly grateful for all of that to be able to continue doing this work. So this afternoon, I'm also really excited to welcome our um, guest um, speaker who will be introduced by someone else, so I will not do that. Um, but I want to thank all of you for coming, um, having an opportunity to bring people together to talk about child welfare in these incredibly challenging times, I think is very important for all of us. Um, and so I would like to welcome Helen Kalan to the podium to introduce our speaker for the afternoon. Um, Dr. Kalan is a member of our faculty and the director of the Child Welfare Education and Research Program within our school, which includes all kinds of amazing programs that some of you are alums of and some of you work for um, and some of you many of you have benefited from so Helen so thank you thank you Betsy and and thanks to all of you for joining us today this is, is such a privilege um, to hold this event and and to have um, our speaker with us today. Um, I want to preface my comments by um, acknowledging the wonderful support and collaboration that the university has enjoyed with the Department of Human Services, Office of Children, Youth, and Families. This has been a long-standing collaborative partnership, and we thank everyone involved for that. So, on to our introduction. Um, I'm here to introduce Laval Miller Wilson to you. Laval joined the Pennsylvania Department of Human Services in March of 2023 as the Deputy Secretary for the Office of Children, Youth, and Families, which supervises the county operated child welfare and juvenile justice systems. Laval is an attorney by profession, and he's deeply committed and passionate about ensuring that vulnerable populations get the care that they need and that they deserve. Prior to joining OCYF, Laval had been the executive director of the Pennsylvania Health Law Project, a nonprofit that protects and advances health care rights through free legal services, community education, and systems advocacy. At PHLP, he worked to make the health industry and policymakers more attuned to what people want and need and more accountable for making it happen. He was lead counsel for Medicaid enrollees on Pennsylvania's Medical Assistance Advisor Committee, which advises the Commonwealth on the impact of current and proposed Medicaid policies and practices. He delivered consumer informed perspectives about the state's implementation of the Affordable Care Act, performance of Medicaid managed care plans, and determinants of health. 
Prior to joining PHLP, Laval worked for 14 years at the Juvenile Law Center, representing children in the child welfare, juvenile, and criminal justice systems. At the Juvenile Law Center, he led the 2008 petition to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court to ensure that accused youth in Luzerne County had the right to counsel, and that was subsequently known as the Kids for Cash scandal. And it also involved federal litigation to prove the delivery of basic and special education to children in the criminal justice system. He was also lead author of a 2003 assessment of children's access to counsel and the quality of representation they receive in Pennsylvania's juvenile justice system, and that required surveying and visiting juvenile courts across the Commonwealth. We are so pleased that Laval is here with us today to talk with us about reflections on the challenges and opportunities facing Pennsylvania's child welfare system. Well, good afternoon. Folks can hear me, it looks like, all right. I can definitely hear myself. I am going to, you know, this is me with the same tie, same, <laughs> same jacket. Things don't change. State government only pays you so much. But more than public interest. <laughs> um, uh, really, did not expect I was gonna have the same, same outfit. <laughs> Um, it's a delight to be here. Um, thank you for that uh, introduction. Um, I wasn't really sure what to expect uh, coming in today to have, uh, wasn't quite sure who the audience was going to be. Um, but when the invitation from Helen and her colleagues uh, came out, I said, yes, OK, let's go. Um, and, uh, and I really appreciate the way this has uh, been set up where we had a chance to have a conversation with one another. Uh, it certainly put me at ease. Um, it was also nice to uh, meet some legends that are in the room um, uh, that I heard about, um, but also from my own staff told me about um, the tremendous respect that they have and the work that they've done. Uh, and I also deeply value that. Uh, and it was really helpful to hear um, about um, just the partnership that's developed with, uh, with CWRC, our Child Welfare Resource Center and the University of Pittsburgh. It is an extraordinary partnership. It's a long partnership um, that, that, uh, that goes back to, we were talking about Feather Houston and Ridge and uh, the transition with, with Bob Casey to Ridge. But also, longevity is not a reason to keep doing something. And uh, especially in the field that we're in, just because you've done it for a long time doesn't mean you should keep doing it for a long time. I value this partnership because uh, CWRC and Pitt um, shares our mission of the importance of preparing and supporting excellent child welfare professionals and systems. Um, and I value, and my colleagues value, its approach, which is rooted in education and research and a commitment to best practice and quality and, uh, improvement. Uh, and there are others that probably are uh, looking their chops saying like, ooh, I wonder when that contract is gonna come up. But we value this partnership, we value the approach uh, for the notes that it uh, has come up, and I've learned a great deal from uh, my CWC partners. Um, Mike and Serena are, are here, and Helen is here, of course, um, for the wisdom that they bring and that they're teaching me and my team. Uh, we certainly know, and I can't, don't, didn't come into this job, as I'll say more about, recognizing that there are quick fixes. Um, early on, we had a little bit, amongst other quick fixes that were pitched to me, um, uh, is, oh, artificial intelligence. You know, here is a way of training your child welfare workforce, and just let's just put on some goggles, and they can understand what... Um, what uh, is in store for them. And uh, um, I needed to be convinced. Um, 
But it was also helpful for uh, the CWRC team to say, you need to come to our Mechanicsburg site and see how we're training our staff, um, our future staff, and, um, and see it done in person and the pedagogy that's associated with that. Um, and the learning, the peer-to-peer -peer learning that's associated with that. Uh, and it was. And more so than just that one example, I'm using it to also describe the wonderful teachers, uh, experienced teachers that, um, that uh, I observed uh, and just felt in terms of the, um, uh, the, the excellence that they were gaining. Uh, in terms of, uh, I, again, not that there can't be improvements, not that, um, that we're still continuous quality improvement of learning what they're, and applying it to their situations, but um, certainly CWRC and the, and the school has been open to those conversations, and I value that, and I thank you for, for that. How many social workers do we have in the audience? Who's been trained in social work? That's what I thought. Very good, very good. Um, uh, I wish I had a degree in social work. Um, it was not on my radar as an undergraduate. I don't know if folks were thinking, did you think I had a degree in social work? I, uh, if you did, and I'm like, Ooh, uh, um, I'm up here now. Um, <laughs> but um, it wasn't on my radar as an undergraduate. Um, I knew I wanted to do some form of child advocacy. Um, but my world uh, of thinking about that extended to the field of education, um, partly from that's what I knew. Um, that's what my parents uh, were and are, um, public school teachers. And, um, and so that was my framework. Um, but I uh, was pretty confident that at some point, if you had asked me, an, an undergraduate, what are you going to end up doing? It was going to be some form of, uh, of child advocacy. Uh, and um, uh, and that was the pathway. And I entered um, first jobs out of college doing that work, first jobs out of um, uh, law uh, or going into law school thinking uh, it would be some amount of child advocacy. Um, uh, the, um, what I'm trying to build toward is just my appreciation. Again, I'm opening up with my envy of social work, but uh, my, my growing appreciation for the field um, and recognizing that I very much lead a department um, whose principal base is social work. But my exposure to the field of social, uh, of social work came from Juvenile Law Center when um, uh, that small group of us, when I started in 1995, um, were innovative in having a social work embedded in our legal practice. Um, I emerged uh, just fully appreciating the value of partnering a lawyer and a social worker together, because collaboratively we can best advance and protect kids together. Not that we don't disagree, and there were moments of disagreement about our professional roles and our ethical roles. The roles, for example, of a lawyer is to um, zealously advocate for the position of their client, of a child. And how can a grown-up advocate for the position of the child, even if that grown-up disagrees with the position of their client? But we're taught in the law that's what you do. It's not your role to disagree with your client. That's an ethical boundary. Um, uh, and a social worker perspective was somewhat different. It, um, and there were moments of, of flare up about that. But, um, but we learned to navigate that with, uh, with one another. Um, and, um, uh, and navigate that most of all for the advancement of, uh, of, our, of, our, uh, of our clients. Um, it was an extraordinary time to be practicing, uh, but a very difficult time when I started in 1995 in Philadelphia. Uh, it was, um, uh, just looking at my notes about an, it, 
It wasn't an easy time uh, practicing in, uh, in the Southeast. Uh, we weren't, and I'll be collective about this, we weren't especially trauma aware. Uh, we were not um, uh, necessarily prevention focused. Uh, we had a lot of removals and a disruption and they all had a racial bent to them. And if you walked into that courtroom, um, you could um, see the injustice. Um, uh, so we did our best at that time um, and, uh, and grew a lot. Um, and my time, as I noted before, at Juvenile Law Center was extraordinary for the folks that I worked with. Um, uh, including some folks that are now in Allegheny. Judge Eleanor Bush um, was one of my um, uh, supervisors, and I'm so glad to have her in the field here. Um, I noted in Helen's introduction that she, um, she noted I spent a lot of time at Juvenile Law Center and then left um, to head over to the Health Law Project. Uh, and it certainly was rewarding uh, there didn't have any social workers, worked with, um, with doctors, but, um, but we certainly worked a lot on social determinants of health. And as, as I was sharing with a couple of folks um, during the reception here, we saw pro and have seen tremendous progress addressing um, health outcomes uh, through social determinants. And I'm so envious, uh, as I noted, but I will share this more broadly with the audience about how we're using Medicaid money for social determinants of health and envious in that I am eager to improve ways to draw down those dollars to improve social determinants for child and family well-being. Again, concretely, we have Medicaid paying for housing supports. We don't quite have a Medicaid through line in a, that exact way for child welfare. We still have to do a lot of additional work to, to get there, but we're better positioned now than we ever have been to do that, and I am very eager to work um, with my colleagues in the department um, to allow counties like this one in Allegheny to, um, to have the flexibility that it needs to advance in that direction. Uh, and eager to have more conversations about that to give uh, the counties flexibility about that. It is, uh, um, it's a privilege to be working in the position that I'm at as Deputy Secretary. When Secretary Arkush uh, called me and said, Laval, I'd like you to be a part of my, uh, my cabinet at the Department of Human Services, I was excited about working with this, um, this physician who I knew uh, from our work together with healthcare reform. Um, and um, it was pretty open. Um, I wanted to work with her. I also wanted to work in this administration. Um, so I said, what did you have in mind? And she said, how about OCYF? <laughs> and I said, no, no, I'm not. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, and uh, because the work, uh, uh, is so, um, it's so tough. It is so tough. I was teasing a little bit. I'm going to ask another question um, uh, about how many of us would go back to doing, oh, well, how many did direct case work? How many of you would go back to doing ca direct case work? Good for you. <laughs> Good for you. I think many of us that did not raise our hands, and I should have raised my hand of not going back, um, are nostalgic for that time. But I'm nostalgic for being a parent of an infant, but I don't want to go back to it. <laughs> it, is, um, uh, it is tough, tough work. Um, and. I think to some degree, that's where I was at when I had that conversation with the secretary. But I wanted to work with her. Um, and then I thought about this, and I chatted with some of my colleagues um, about it, and just reflected, as we all need to do with big decisions, right? And I thought, 
yeah, this work pulls at your heart. And your heart breaks almost every day when you do this work. But as Diane has seen me in this position, you also get stronger when you do this work. Every day you get stronger and stronger and stronger. So um, I want to talk a bit about what's on my mind, because Helen had said, I don't know, Laval, just talk. <laughs> <laughs> Tell folks what's on your mind. Um, uh, and so what's on my mind th at this juncture, a year and a half in, is workforce. Uh, and folks have heard me talk about this, but it continues to go back to the, challenging, uh, the challenge of workforce. And I think I'm more channeling other people than, than just, just noting it. That's what we're all concerned about, recognizing that the basic axiom of a strong and experienced workforce is just the backbone of how we need to succeed in this field of human services, and recognizing that the front line is with our county children and youth agencies, and they are struggling to do their work protecting kids. Um, and they are, goes back to the difficulty with retaining and um, recruiting, first of all, and then retaining qualified staff. Um, I think that I want to describe a little bit about the structure of the system. I'm not going to spend too much time because I know this audience, but it just is notable that, um, that we are all in this situation of owning this responsibility, that it is um, our system in Pennsylvania is state supervised and county operated. And I certainly take responsibility in the state side for the situation um, that we're in. But the sec the, I talked about how hard this job is from my perspective. The hardest jobs are in our county where the counties are the lead agency for this awesome responsibility of protecting kids. And, um, and we have given, in our state, counties that responsibility that they cannot get out of. The legislature has said, you can contract out a lot of things, counties, but you cannot contract investigations. You have to do this work. Um, and uh, that work is extraordinarily hard. It is, um, folks know that work. Um, I would add, it is increasingly, um, I'm gonna be careful, I'm on camera a bit. It is, it is becoming more and more unsafe to do this work. Um, I hear this as I go to counties and I have conversations with county children and youth, whether it's in urban areas, whether it's in rural areas. The politics of the environment that we are in are not helping. And, and uh, folks are also starting to realize the awesome power of the state um, and also pushing back and saying, I'm not having you come into my home. And if you're going to come into my home, you better bring a court order. Um, there's been a Supreme Court case, um, Pennsylvania Supreme Court case, about this very topic, about the authority that a children and youth worker need to come into a, a, a home. Um, uh, and I don't necessarily want to get into that case, except just to highlight this is becoming more and more challenging. And then one of the nightmares of the many that I'm sure our counties have is that responsibility of getting a call, as we we're noting in the middle of the night, with somebody getting hurt. Um, and it doesn't matter what county you're in, um, those still come up. So without, it is one of the most difficult jobs uh, that, uh, that's in county government. And I also think um, that with regard to my observations about what's happening in the counties, is um, we have squeezed as much as we can out of um, the efficiencies. Now, some may 
disagree about that. I'd be interested in hearing that reaction to that statement. You know, we were talking about AI as a way, as I noted earlier, about ways of efficient, making the system more efficient, and that, to me, compromises quality. But we are squeezing as much efficiency out of, out of things, and that's why that, that question I posed, would you go back, and I'm interested in hearing from those folks that say, no, I wouldn't go back, Laval. Um, is it because the environment of this work is much harder? Um, I would proffer probably yes, but I'm eager to hear more about that, and I think that's why we need to keep asking ourselves these questions. Um, do you think that we're improving the environment um, for the workers that we um, are sending out into the field? And I think that the environment, again, is much, much more difficult. I do think that the legislature was wise to say this is a local function, this is a county function. Um, I don't think you can get any more local than this topic of investigating, um, receiving reports of child abuse and maltreatment. And um, I have to be careful about using this word investigating, supporting families, asking what's going on, how can we help you? That is local government, I argue, at its best. Um, and you want that um, uh, to be people that are from a county, that know a county. Um, it's, it's as local as what we seem to see with voting in our state. Counties control voting. Um, counties control schools. Um, counties. Uh, for the most part, deal with law enforcement. Counties can and should deal with child protective services too. And it, you have to persuade me, not that I'm the one that's making the decisions on this, this is a general assembly determination, why you would say, okay, counties, contract that out. Um, I think it continues to be, no, if we contract that out, we're losing something. But that circles back to the challenges. The counties are still struggling to meet those obligations and struggling mightily to do that. How do I know this? Because I'm out in the field. Um, and my staff are out in the field. And we are putting counties more and more into um, provisional licensing statuses. Now, we could have a whole other conversation about whether licensing and the approach that we take to supporting our counties is the right pathway, and maybe we will use this forum to talk a little bit about that. But my point is really about um, what we're observing at OCYF, that we're observing more and more counties struggling. We're having to impose some sort of oversight and accountability on that, or that's what we do, and we are having to impose some sort of sanction on the county because it's all coming back to staffing. You don't have enough staff, and the staff that you don't do have are not prepared. Not from a CWRC standpoint, although I acknowledge, again, we all can do some work. But supervision is so key. How many of us, and I heard this earlier, are successful because of the supervision that we had? Well, I'm really worried about that level of supervision that we have today. So we're putting a number of counties into provisional statuses and um, are doing our best to support those counties. But also, this is the tension. We're not coming in and interested in taking over a county. And who wants Harrisburg to come in and start running a county? Go back to what I was noting before. This is a local approach, or it should be. We have some stats that we just um, commissioned a study on recruitment and retention in county children and youth agencies, and it's nearing completion. It's a little overdue, but um, it's coming. 
we profiled or had 10 county children and youth agencies uh, that we that volunteered and, and reviewed um, that and dedicated some time to, to participating in the study. And here's some of the key pieces that stood out to me. During the last five fiscal years, one in two county children and youth workers separated from employment within the first two years. First two years of being hired. Thanks, no thanks, leaving. In fiscal year in 23 alone, we had one in five county children and youth workers leaving their job. It ends up being the highest rate in five years. We have one in four caseworker positions open in, in, uh, in fiscal year 23. Uh, and there's a vacancy rate that is doubling. It went from 10% to 25% in fiscal year 2018 to fiscal year 22. Those are enormous losses, not sustainable. Um, the reason um, is a concern is, uh, is the insufficient pay. Um, when I've gone out and had conversations with counties, they have um, told me, Laval, I'm working two jobs. Um, I'm earning more money as a bartender than I am in a county children and youth agency. Um, uh, the other quote I wrote down is, yeah, I'm, I'm still working at Aldi. Oh, and the other one I didn't write down, but should have, I'm on public ass assistance. Which is not embarrassing. I'm not, you know, but it is stunning that that's where we're at in some places, in some parts of Pennsylvania. Uh, I have some stats about pay, but I'm not going to go over uh, with that. Low pay is part of the issue. It's not the alpha and the omega. We're also finding that the profession is losing appeal amongst young people because its value is, is being attacked. Um, they're feeling that the work, they, the workers, are feeling that their work is misunderstood. Um, particularly by those that are on the outside making some emotionally charged judgments about, um, about the actions of the agencies and the case workers. 10 years ago, Mark Turner and I were talking about this just before, he said to me, you know, the investigative, the news media and journalism has little, lost a little bit of an edge and I think that that's true. But the judgment about our workers is still there, and it's higher than ever. Um, it's definitely not uncommon for an assumption um, of wrongdoing by our county children and youth workers. On the one hand, county children and youth workers should intervene more often. On the other hand, they're quick to assume the overreach especially the latter end, we're in this tension. Damned if you do, damned if you don't. And it's the caseworker who becomes the focus of the attention. And, um, and, and it gets devolving into a, a blame game um, about the worker and not necessarily the bigger story about the family. Not to demonize the family either, but the work that needs to be done to support the family. It just gets lost in the culture at times that we're in. The arrests of county children and youth workers in Pennsylvania, in Lackawanna and Adams counties, have had a real impact on staffing. I don't know if folks are aware of this, but uh, in June of last year, there were five arrest warrants that were issued for three workers and two supervisors in Lackawanna County uh, for their Office of Youth and Families um, for endangering the welfare of children and failing to report abuse, felony charges, now, our office took a look at that situation, and um, 
we did place the office on a provisional license and took some accountability. But we weren't making that referral to the district attorney's office. The district attorney believed that, um, that the approach of, uh, of uh, against these workers was to go ahead and say, we're gonna arrest them at their place of employment uh, and have them handcuffed and walked out. For in those situations, what appears to be um, failure to remove kids from more neglectful situations than abusive situations. In Adams County, we had three and have three workers who were arrested and charged with felony child endangerment. That was in connection with the death of a child. Um, we also investigated that. And um, again, those are different situations. But my point in raising both of these is that um, it is creating an environment that is radioactive and going to other counties and making um, workers say, why should I go into this? Why should I, knowing that people are taking second and third mortgages out on a home, knowing the interest rates, to pay a criminal defense lawyer um, becomes uh, a warning to say, I don't think you want to go into this field. Um, so I think that, that there has to be, and what we've lost, I'm thinking about some of the themes that Helen was saying, like, be real. It's, um, we're, we're, we're getting closer to where trust is starting to become broken. And the public trust and confidence uh, in the system that keeps kids safe, I'm worried about. And you should be worried about, and we should all be worried about, about that. Because there's not that much more give in the system that's left. I do think that we're putting too much burden on our child welfare system. I think our system is stretched too thin. Um, I think it's an opportunity to reflect who do we need to concentrate more on. And this is where it's helpful um, to be informed by our seasoned folks about how did we get here? And in 10 years ago, in 2014, we did, as a commonwealth, enact a lot of legislation that dramatically changed policies and procedures that govern child protective services, including these investigations, including reports of child abuse, uh, and who is a mandatory, mandated reporter, and how the reports have to be made, uh, and how these investigations have to be categorized and conducted. Um, and as well as who's maintained on the registry. There were a ton of changes that came through. The data shows it. I didn't come in with slides, um, but the data shows it. Reports to, um, to the state-operated helpline um, went up immediately in 2014, and they are at record highs now. The pandemic took us back. We are now receiving over, uh, it's a lot of calls. <laughs> it's a lot of calls. Um, and those are calls that often result in referrals to counties to investigate. Child protective services cases, general protective services cases. Counties, you have the responsibility, go out and do it. Um, so that's the situation that we're seeing. Workforce, demands, um, and what's the way out? Well, um, the way out, again, no easy fixes, 
But a way out is um, recognizing that the responsibility of supporting kids and families isn't just a county responsibility. It, um, it is, uh, or, or the county children and youth agency. It is a whole of government approach within a county, first of all. We can radiate that out to the state. It's not just an OCYF responsibility in terms of our office, and it's not just a DHS responsibility. It is a whole of government, and we need to work more collaboratively with our other departments, um, including health and our drug and alcohol, but also education as well, of a whole of government approach about what we can do to support families, first of all, to reduce child maltreatment. Um, and it is why I'm very happy to be a part of this administration and working with the secretary and working with partners. Now, what are we trying to do at OCYF? Um, we are trying to think about some new fiscal approaches um, to support counties and reward them, reward them for retaining staff. Um, uh, and for saying, you're doing a good job, here's some additional funding for what you're doing to maintain. That's gonna require some changes to the fiscal code, but we're open to that conversation. We're especially open to that conversation with some of our counties that are less populated and don't have a taxpayer base to rely on. And they are saying more and more to us, Laval, we can't get out of this. We don't, we can't raise our dollars, so, can you do more of a state match? And the secretary is saying, think about it. It's not gonna be June 30th of 24, but we are thinking a lot more about how to help, especially those counties. Um, we are um, spending more time thinking about counties that are coming to us and saying, we need some help, we need more technical assistance, we might find ourselves in short-term strategies. Can you come up with a rapid response plan? We're thinking about it. We're probably doing more than that. We're planning it. Um, we have some challenges in the law to deal with, but um, it is underway, and we'll see where things go on that to deal with the crisis situation. And um, in terms of the workforce, I circle back to the partnership we have with CWRC. Um, uh, and Pittsburgh with regard to um, uh, our child welfare education and leadership programs. We cannot take those for granted, and if anything, looking for ways to expand those programs. The other pieces that I think impact the environment that we're in is um, I'm excited about a universal assessment tool, a UAT that's gonna improve um, our approach for decision making related to safety and risk factors. It's overdue. Some counties have led in Allegheny uh, in, in um, been ad advanced on that. I think the core questions that come up, um, is, it, is it gonna accurately assess risk? Is it gonna change our workplace to make it more data driven? Uh, we're asking those questions and we'll see how it works. Um, I do think that it is going to transform, and this is uh, for CWRC, about how we teach people to assess risk. I'm really pretty excited about this tool and think it is going to be pretty transformative. Um, just as though there was a moment, um, I think 12 years ago, where we transformed how we're assessing risk, and this is another opportunity that's, that's coming. Um, uh, and I think we're trying to do our best to get ready for it. I'm excited about our child welfare case management system, which is a new way of collecting information and having real-time information about, um, about our systems. Uh, and again, trying to get improved data exchanges between counties and OCYF that I gotta say I'm a bit embarrassed about. Um, I thought we'd be further along in terms of the collection of data and it's not great. Uh, it's gonna take a while to get there and then it's gonna take a while for us to, but I don't wanna take too long. As we're building this system, immediately how are you gonna use it? 
So we're spending a lot of time building the system and making sure counties get involved. But right out the gate, how are we going to use the data? What are we going to do? Uh, and we need to spend some more time thinking about that as, um, as a department with our county partners. Um, and then a couple other pieces is um, uh, we need to do more work reviewing child fatalities and near fatalities uh, across the Commonwealth with our regions, with our counties. Act 33 was passed by the General Assembly and put us on a pathway of review. I think it's time to ask, is it working? Is it making a difference? Um, what other approaches should we be taking? Um, and that's a collective response, but I am starting to grow thin in my um, patience for, um, for that. I have the privilege but the heartbreak of reading about fatalities and near fatalities that uh, my staff send me. My staff also participate in those Act 33 reviews, and that's not to say that counties know this too. What, is the, what are those reviews doing for us? Um, how are we changing and shaping? Uh, um, what are we learning? What else do we need to do? Um, the secretary has noted for me, and Laval, a number of these fatalities involve kids that don't even have an open CYS case, um, which raises additional set of questions. Uh, so those are some of the areas that have caught um, my attention that I am feeling urgency about, but also pretty excited about, um, about the work that's ahead. Uh, and I'm mostly excited about, not mostly, I'm excited also about working with the people that are in this room um, and, uh, and the collaboration. I have not met many people, nor have you, that shouldn't be in this field. Like people, people want to be in this field. Um, I don't think we've been in a situation where we said, oh, you need to leave, get, get out. You're, you're hurting families. Nobody's going in this field to do harm. But there is this issue of, okay, you can, you can be more informed, but you can also learn. Just like I learned a lot in 1995 before becoming a bit more trauma-informed and trauma-competent and trauma-aware. Um, and here I am, um, 10 years later, um, more informed, more aware, but not losing my heart. <laughs>